watered, refreshed. So, what are we going to be looking? Great requirements, basic elements of power supplies. So, I've been looking, after we've gone through the basic elements of what goes into a power supply, we're going to be looking at DC supplies. Very straightforward, very easy. Simple rectification with diodes. Phase control rectifiers, switch mode systems. At some point, our electrical engineers will know all about this, but you might need to correct me on one or two occasions. Cycling converters, what do we need? Energy storage, waveform criteria. How do we do it? Slow cycling, medium cycling, fast cycling, modern medium cycling, capacitive storage. And then finally, the great dragon that sits in the woods. The bogeyman of accelerators, the delay line mode of resonance, which you've never heard of before, have you? I'd be darn glad that you've never heard of it. <laughs> Shouldn't be there. If it is, it's, it's disastrous. Basic requirements. So what do we basically need for DC applications? This would be storage rings, cyclotrons, synchrotrons, the whole damn lot. Um, we need smooth, we need a smooth DC. Um, ripple. Variation is better than one part of the of five. Amplitude stability. You don't want the things bouncing up and down all the time. Between one part in ten to the four and one part in ten to the five. And then we need to be able to, from the control room with a knob, or more likely with a computer these days, to be able to adjust the amplitude with all these requirements, with a resolution of the order of one part in ten to the five, over a range of one, one at least one in ten, if not more. And then for synchrotrons, where we are oscillating and changing the field level in the dipoles and in the quadrupoles, we need to have energy storage because when the magnets have got high flux density, that they've got energy, they're storing work, then when they come back down again, it's got to go somewhere. And then we need to control the amplitude between minimum and maximum current, which is the field. And then, if at all possible, in a cycling accelerator, it would be very nice to have control, not just of the amplitude at the top and the bottom, but also of the waveform when it goes from A to B. It's no good saying you know the way from London to Brighton. You start in London, you go to Brighton. You do need to have some knowledge as to which route you take. And it would be very nice if you could control the route that the particles take going from minimum to maximum. So the overview, the things that we're going to be talking about, what do we need in the generic power converter? Notice the words, not power supply, but power converter, <coughs> because it's not actually generating the power. It's taking the power from somewhere, uh, the main system, and putting it into the magnets. And so the first thing, here, here's three phases coming in. I hope you're all acquainted with what three phase systems are. Yep. Um, we need to have switch gear. It sounds very trivial, but it ain't trivial. They've got to operate, and they've got to be safe, and they've got to protect you, they've got to protect people, they've got to protect the system, they've got to protect the building, etc. And then we need a transformer, we've got to go up and down, and then there'll be a rectifier, and then we've got to regulate the system, we've got to regulate the amplitudes, not to 1% or 0.1%, but to one part in 10 to the 4, if not better, and we need something called a servo system. Have you all heard of a servo system? Is this a new word, new phrase to anybody? No. Okay, you know what a servo system is. Um, and we need to smooth it. And then we need to monitor it. We need to know how much current is going in to our magnet to a resolution of one part in 10 to the 5. And at the same time, we want to send that information to the control room to know that the power supply is working properly. And we really do have 482.531 amps. Um, and we also need to put a signal back from the monitor, which tells how much current is going in, to the device that regulates the amplitude as the part of the servo system. And you can make them one of the same thing, in which case this can system go completely out of Kimbo, and the control room tells you you've got the, the right field, and the servo system thinks it's got the right field, and you haven't got the right field. So you usually would need to duplicate this as well. Let's have a look at the typical components. Some of these you'll be very well aware of, others you may not be. Switch gear, on and off, protection against overcurrent, overvoltage, earth leakage, people jumping on the power supplies and whatever. 
Transformer changes voltage, matches impedance level, provides essential galvanic, galvanic isolation between the kit there and the mains. That's important. And it's going to be at least three phase and sometimes six phase or sometimes 12 phase. And then we need rectifiers. We use rectifiers both in DC and in AC supplies. Because the first thing you do if you're making an AC supply is rectify. And then we need a number of different types of rectifier, which we will get into. Then we need to regulate it. The level setting, the stabilization of the high gain servo system, strongly linked with the rectifier. You'll see that these two are now quite strongly coupled. And then smoothing. Either a passive filter, which is just an LC circuit, or an active filter, which has got dynamics and semiconductors in it and amplifiers, and look to see what's happening and adjusts accordingly. And then we need to monitor so we know what the difference is going on. We need to monitor in the control room. We need to know if there's a fault on. So, start off simple. Diodes. You've all seen one of these. That's what you get in the laboratory. That's what you might get in your um, heating circuit at home. This is what you will get in a power supply for an accelerator. 350 amps, 2.5 kilovolts. What a straightforward diode. Conducts in one direction, it won't conduct in the other direction. After it has cleared the carriers in the semiconductor. So it isn't just a simple switch. Conducts forward direction only. Modern devices can conduct in about a microsecond. They can turn on in a microsecond or less. The, there is always a voltage drop in a diode. I think it's typically between 0.6 and 0.8 of a volt. So even if it's taking 350 amps, um, there's going to be the order of nearly 350 watts, which is why this thing is meant to be mounted on a heat sink. So it dissipates power. And ratings up to many hundreds of amps average. And note that there's a difference between the average current, the peak current, and the RMS current. And all three differ. The, the loss in the diode is given by the average current. Um, the, energy, the, the, the power lost in the lead is given by the RMS current. And the rating of the diode is controlled by the peak current. So... Now, the next grade up of, of diodes is a thyristor. Everybody heard of a thyristor? Anybody not heard of a thyristor? No, everyone's heard of a thyristor. You've heard of a thyristor? No? No? Yes, right, okay. This is a diode that switches. And it's, it starts off um, with voltage across it and it won't conduct. But there's a third, um, there's a third electrode, it would be electrode if it was a valve, there's a, there's a third contact here, which when this is pulsed, then it starts to conduct. And it keeps on conducting until the current drops to zero. That's what the semiconductors look like. So, with stands forward and reverse volts, if it's not in the conducting mode, apart from perhaps some small fraction of a milliamp which leaks through it, then conducts forward when the gate is pulsed. This is the gate. And it conducts until the current drops to zero and momentarily reverses again to clear the carriers from the semiconductor and then you can't belt it in the next few microseconds with more forward voltage there's got to be a recovery time before it will take forward voltages again perhaps of the order of 50 perhaps even more microseconds and it doesn't switch on very quickly it switches on in about five microseconds and during that time the voltage across the device drops and the current in the device rises. And so if you integrate those two, take the product and integrate them, again, it's dissipating energy in the thyristor. Therefore, D and Di by dt is limited during early conduction to the order of um, some, I don't know, it used to be 5 or 10 amps per microsecond. It's probably much better than that now. But it can't just suddenly go bang up to 10 kiloamps. Available in hundreds of amps, average current. Again, average is different to peak and RMS. And kilovolts, forward and reverse volts. And that's what they look like. And there again, it's mounted on a heat sink. <coughs> and here's the main current current conductor. 
here's the other, here's the base, and then you put the you put the pulse across here. The gate pulse goes across here. Positive on the red lead, negative on the on the white lead. And it takes a pulse of about five amp, five volts and quite a few milliamps, I think, to pulse. What's the difference between a thyristor and a transistor? Do they work the same way? No. Um, a transistor is um, a linear device mm -hmm. where if you're operating it in class A, you control the voltage on essentially the gate to control the current mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the transistor. Uh, and so it's working like a variable resistor. Right, okay. You can put it hard on as well. It will yeah. work as a switch. You can, yeah. if you saturate the gate, it will switch hard on. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thyristor doesn't have this ability. Right, okay. Um, uh, the, the, the thyristor is either on or off. Yeah, the transistor. Whereas would be more the transistor, well, the transistor would be working in what's called class C, okay. isn't it? If, if, it's, if it's operated as a switch. Uh, and, and generally, you operate the transistor in, in a class A mode, uh -huh. where, it's very, where it's actually controlling the amplitude of the current through it okay. from the current bias which is going into the gate. Um, and for that, you, um, you lose out on the fact of its ability to take high currents and high voltages. Okay. And I don't think the transistor will take reverse voltage, will it? Mm, will the sure. transistor take reverse voltage? I don't think it will. No, it won't take reverse voltage. The thyristor will take reverse voltage. Okay? I think if you, if you put a reverse voltage across a transistor, it would be a big pop. Yeah. And you'll have to replace it. Um, put a reverse voltage across a thyristor. Um, as long as it's within the racing, it just sits there and smiles at you. Next one, an insulated <laughs> gate bipolar transistor, an IGBT. This is supposedly a transistor. Here's the, um, here's the structure of the thing. I'm not going to go into the semiconductor behavior. Uh, again, it would need about 15 minutes or more. There's the symbol for it. Um, and what this does, it can switch off as well. You see, the, tr the, the thyristor cannot be switched off for an external circuit. There's got to be, the main current circuit has got to drop to zero, the current, before the, before the thyristor will switch off. It's not controlled once it's conducting. Whereas this thing is, can be controlled and switched on and off. The gate controls conduction, switching the device on and off. It's far faster than the thyristor, can operate in tens of kilohertz. Dissipate significant power during switching. Again, you know, the, the, the voltage doesn't drop to zero immediately. The voltage comes down and the current goes up, so there's dissipation during the switching. It is available at around 2 kilovolts forward and hundreds of amps average. Perhaps electrical <coughs> engineers might know that the, the, the 2 kilovolts is now a bit old-fashioned. Perhaps it's more than 2 kilovolts available. I, d I don't know. I'm not up to date on the ratings available. But it will not withstand appreciable reverse volts. Um, a series blocking diode is sometimes used to prevent the volts going in reverse on it. And it will not conduct reverse current. So sometimes you put another diode in reverse across the IGBT for what's called a freewheeling diode. Anyone heard of a freewheeling diode? You'll see why it's used in a minute. Okay? So, um, who, who, who has not come across the IGBT before? You guys all know about them. Yeah, you, yes, oh, yeah, okay, you've, you've heard about them. And then monitoring. A, um, there's a device called a DCCT, a direct current current transformer. Now, we all know the transformers will transform AC, but have you ever heard of a transformer that will transform DC? Is this anybody, is this new to everybody? What about electrical engineers? Have you heard of DCCTs? No, right, oh well. The way it works, it's a ring of high permeability ferrite material. You put a single turn of the heavy current lead. That's supposed to be going to the hole in the middle. Okay. They just, it just, you know, the, the thing about that side, you just put the lead through the middle. And that's carrying the DC. Now, there are three other windings on this device. There is, first of all, a DC bias there, which puts a DC in. And that is the DC that is going to be transformed from that by perhaps a out of 100 to 1 or 1,000 to 1. And it just depends on the number of turns that you put there. That is one turn. 
if you put 100 turns there, it's going to be 100 to 1 transform down. You're transforming down from high current to low current where you can measure it. Okay. You have also um, a reasonably high frequency AC perturbation going in on another winding. And you then have a detector, a voltage detector here, which looks for that frequency and sees whether it is going round in the in the core. The way it works is this, but that is a continuous circuit. So if you put a thousand amps through there, it is saturated totally. There's hardly any flux going, well, there's a lot of flux going around it, but it is totally saturated and the permeability has come down to one. And so um, this AC is still bleeping away there, but the detector doesn't see any. It doesn't see any signal from this because the transformer is saturated. So then there's an automatic system that increases the DC bias until the amper turns there is exactly equal to the amper turns there. And at that point, there is no saturated flux going around here. And the only, the only flux that's going around is the flux generated by this thing. And that detector then sees it and says, whoopee, that's it, lads. That's transformed and is the right value. These things can be accurate to one part in 10 to the 5. And whilst you might have a 1,000 amps coming through here, you might have one amp going through there. And that would then be a 1,000 turns. And they work. And there's, there's companies that specialise in making these things. And this is the most accurate way of measuring a high current. I mean, I mean what's the alternative? Put a resistor in there, you know? Put a 1 ohm resistor in a 1,000 amp lead and then keep it cool. That's the best way of doing it. <coughs> DC supplies. Again, we're starting with very simple, and we're going to go to the complicated. So, who doesn't, everybody's seen this. There, there's an AC feed, it goes to a transformer, there's a centre tap, we've got um, a diode in that direction, and a diode in that direction, and that's going to give positive, and that's going to give negative, and you look at the volts there with respect to that, they go blump, 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 at each half sine wave. Okay, perfectly straightforward. You've made one in your garage or your back garden shed when you were 15 years of age. Yep, yep. Yep. No, oh, right. Yes, we have. Yes. <laughs> Classical full wave circuit. If you only had one of these diodes, it would only be a half wave circuit. Uncontrolled. We're not controlling the, the amplitude in any way. All we can do is turn it on and off. Large ripple. Look at that. It's 100% ripple. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Large capacitor would be needed here. Big, fat, healthy capacitor would be needed to smooth it. It's really only suitable for small loads like keeping your um, homemade radio operational, which is probably what you use it for. Okay, the next one up is a three-phase diode rectifier. A three-phase, six-pulse, it's called, because there are six rectifiers here. And here's the, um, here's the, the three-phase supply coming in. There's the primary, there's the secondary. The secondary feeds this bridge circuit. And then at any one time, the voltage on any one of these lines is going to snuff out the current. It's going to reverse the voltage on one of the other diodes. And so these diodes, whilst that is the voltage coming into the bridge, the voltage out of the bridge is just following the top line here. Let me stabilize this. The voltage out just does that. Okay. So it's a three phase, phase six pulse system. There is still no amplitude control. Much lower ripple with six pulses, 12% of six harmonic, 300 hertz, but low pass filters will still be needed. This is pretty straightforward conventional stuff, been used for probably the early 20th century. Is this okay with everybody? Yeah, nobody new to it? No? Okay, fine. Thyristor control. Now, instead of having the diode that we had in that picture, we've now replaced them with thyristors. Oh, here's Laura. Marvellous. Thank you very much, Laura. That's very good of you. The, the printouts are available. Do you want to grab them for this lecture, or do you want to carry on flying blind and pick them up on the way out and then find out the mistakes they've made? Okay. Right. So we're now replacing the diode with thyristors. And we're going to control. Remember, with the thyristor, you can't turn it off, but you can turn it on. And you can control the time at which you turn it on. And it is that time control that's important. If you're going to go to B&Q and buy yourself a dimmer switch for the, for the lights, and um, 
if you work on anything that doesn't have got a fluorescent tube in it. And that's got a thyristor, which just varies the phase, advances or retards the phase of switching on. So, for conduction, if it's working like a diode, it does exactly the same as the diode, but voltage, bump, 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 like that. And that's when the thyristor is turned on, all six thyristors are turned on fully like diodes. What's the next step? Well, the next step is to delay it slightly, so that you fire the thyristor a little bit after the voltage has gone through the peak across that thyristor. So that one turns on, and you hold on, you hold that on until you fire the next thyristor, which again is after that has seen the peak voltage. And so instead of getting the, the top of that waveform, you now get clunk, 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 clunk. And the average V out is reduced from the peak. But notice the ripple is bigger. That's called half conduction. And the more you delay switching these on, the lower the voltage gets that you're getting out of this um, bridge. You can take it right the way down to zero. So here's the thyristor switching on, and it's going down to here in terms of the voltage until you pulse the next thyristor on. And so this is zero volts, and it's called freewheeling. And it's not producing any volts out. Now, do you think that's the limit as far as we can go? Anybody think we can go further? Notice there's still a white space in the bottom right-hand corner. Because then you can go to full negative output voltage called inversion. And so you're delaying switching any one thyristor on by essentially half a cycle. So there it switches on, the next one switches on, the next one switches on, and the V out is down here. It is negative. Now, remember, the current cannot be negative. The current has got to be in the forward direction. Otherwise, the thyristors would switch off. So this will only be possible if you have an external circuit, like an inductor, which is still pushing current through the thyristor. So the, the, the voltage is negative. The current is positive. So this is taking energy out of, the, of an external circuit. So that's putting energy in, that's putting it half the energy in, that's putting no energy going in or out, and this is pulling energy out. And there's got to be somewhere where that energy is sitting, in an inductor. And then this works. But if it's just open circuit, then it won't, it won't do this. Is this new to many people? Yes, right. But current must always be in the forward direction. And there's a full 12-phase control circuit. That gets really complicated. But that's a piece of genuine electrical engineering. 12 pulse. Um, with, here's the load. And here's the filters. And here's the capacitors. And here's the transformer, etc. So that's a genuine piece of, of a professional electrical engineering. Again, you see this every day. Like all thyristor rectifiers, the word is line commutated. The switching of the thyristor is called the commutation, and it is line commutated. What is turning the thyristors off at the end of their little time to pulse is the voltage going higher in another circuit. It is line commutated. You can't turn them off internally except by pulsing another thyristor to bring it on. That's producing a 600 hertz ripple of about 6%. So we're still miles away from where we want to be. Smoothing filters are still needed. The thyristor rectifier gives good precision with proper filtering that can be used in a servo system to provide one part in a, in a, in a thousand. Um, <coughs> time. Not too bad. One part in a thousand um, precision. The inversion <laughs> could be used to protect an external load. If you get into the oh my god situation, there's too much happening. The thyristors can go in into inversion and pull energy out of the load. That's very useful. But have you noticed two things? First of all, as you went further and further down, the ripple went bigger and bigger and bigger. And the ripple going into the load is big. But the ripple going back into the main system is big as well. And so if you've got a little 2 kilowatt sitting in the corner, no problem. If you've got 
half a megawatt or one megawatt of kit over there. The electricity plight people, seeing all these harmonics coming back into their system, they moan like hell. And then, additionally, the current that is being taken into the load is not in phase with the voltage that is going in to the system. And so it is not a resistive load, it is a reactive load, it is an inductive load. And again, the, the supply authority do not like inductive loads because it's out of phase with the rest of their system. And so there are, there's lots of problems associated with this and quite often you have to compensate for these problems. So it, the injected harmonic into the load is 50 hertz, AC distribution system at large angles, OMA. So that's yes, that's the that's the problem. Right now, let's come to the let's come to the the pièce de résistance, as someone might say, a switch mode power supply. Who's got um, uh, either a mobile phone charger with them or a, um, a, a a laptop charger with them? Would you like to hold up your laptop charger? Should have brought one with me. Right, everybody, what's inside that little black box? It's got 240 volt mains going in, and it's got what? 10, 10 volts, 8 volts coming out. DC, AC in, DC out. What's inside that box? I'm going to take a wild guess and say it's the thing on your slide. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. I'm stupid, aren't I? Give me. Yes, one of those. <laughs> but what are they? Haven't got a clue. Pardon? Haven't got a clue. Right. Well, is there a transformer in there? Yes. Who thinks there's a transformer in there? Yeah, right. Have you ever seen the sign of a mains transformer? You know. Sitting inside there. 50 hertz. I'll tell you what's in there. The 240 volts goes in, single phase. It is immediately rectified by diodes sitting on that input state. So it makes a very crude, very poor quality DC, but it's DC. Sitting inside there is a couple of tiny little IGBTs and some very clever semiconductor technology, probably a microprocessor, which switches the IGBTs on and off to make perhaps 10 kilohertz, 15 kilohertz square wave. That then goes into a transformer. Because the size of a transformer is inversely proportional to the frequency that it's transforming. Because the volts on the secondary is given by d phi by dt. <coughs> and with a main transformer, the d by dt term is fixed at 50 hertz. So you have to have a big B to give you the 240 volts out on the, or whatever it is on the secondary. But if you've gone to 15 kilohertz, the d by dt term is bloody enormous. So you can have a tiny little output um, and you can have a tiny little transformer to give you the output that you required. So it comes out of this little ferrite transformer as a, um, at the right voltage level. And then it goes into, it's smooth on the capacitor, maybe at least that size. Uh, and then it, there's the, <coughs> the semiconductor circuits check mm -hmm. what the amplitude is. And if it's wrong, it sends a signal to the switch system of the IGBT and controls the switching, the, the mark space ratio of the switching, to give you exactly the right voltage out. And then eventually there's perhaps another smoother and it goes into your computer. And that is essentially what we have here. So this gentleman was right. So here's the mains coming in. We rectify it. It is inverted into a kilohertz switching with IGBTs. And so here we get the transformer, and, and that's what it's going to look like, these pulses. They may be sitting around zero. Yes, they should be sitting around zero. And then you've got a high-frequency rectifier, and then it goes into a passive filter, and then it goes into a DCCT that gives a signal back to here that controls the switching rate. And that then goes into the load. How complicated, you may say. People, when I first heard of this, I said, madness. The only thing is, it's about a 50th of the price and about a 50th of the weight and about the 50th of the size of doing it with 240 volts, 50 hertz. And we're doing it in particle accelerators. 
perhaps not as trivially small as the charger for the um, for the, uh, for the um, whether it's a mobile phone or for the computer. Okay, so here's the stages of power conversion. Incoming AC is rectified to give a raw DC. The DC is chopped above 10 kilohertz with an inverter chopper using IGBTs. The AC is transformed to the required level. The transformer size is 1 over omega, determined by the d5 by dt. It is then AC rectified. It is then filtered, and the filter is so much smaller at 10 kilohertz. Then it is the regulation is by feedback and fast protection is possible. You can turn off the chopping as well. And the response is very fast. If it's wrong, you can sort it out in just a couple of microseconds. So that is the modern technology of switch mode power supplies, which are now being used in mobile phones, now being used on laptop computers, now being used in particle accelerators, now being used, I suspect, in locomotives on the main line, or at least similar things than that. And transport is the most demanding. You've got to control the thing. And uh, I think even, I think now the semiconductors are available to be put into locomotives. I'm not completely certain of that, but that's again something that our electric engineers might be. I'm not going to go through all this little lot, but this is a, an inverter or chopper. Um, and here is the supply and the, the polarity of the supply. It's a DC supply. The polarity there is fixed, positive and negative, but it will take current in either direction. So if it's taking current in either direction, it can be energy going in or it can be energy coming out. And then it goes into this switching system. And notice, this has got the three-wheel diodes I was talking about. And here's a, a, a four-quadrant um, chopper. And each IGBT has got a three-wheeling diode. And then here is the load. And depending on how you switch these things on and off, then in fact the voltage across the load can be positive or negative, and the current in the load can be positive or negative as well. And I'm not going to go through the whole, it would take another five minutes saying that this is on and that's on and this is on. So you can sit back and you can work through this uh, when you've got a bit more time. So that is a vital concept that the inverter or chopper is now available for power applications. That just explains what's going on. It doesn't explain it. It just gives you the functionality of the thing. So we're now going to look at cycling converters. We're getting now closer to what we put into our magnets. We need to raise the magnet current during acceleration. Will ordinary AC do? Well, we've already talked about this. The required magnetic field is unidirectional, going from low to high, not from negative to positive, going from low slightly positive to high positive as well. So that's what a, 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 a pure side wave would look like. We want to inject there and we want to extract there. And only a quarter of a cycle is used. It's very inefficient because there's excess RMS current. There's high AC losses. There's high gradient of injection. Gradient of injection is important. If you've got the maximum dB by dt at injection, it means that any jitter in the injection time is going to see the wrong field. So in fact, you don't want to inject at a high injection gradient. You want to go in at a low injection gradient. And when the beam is in the accelerator, it is captured by phase stability. Done phase stability? Yes, phase stability. Phase stability. Remember, once you've got the beam stable with the RF system, you can vary the magnetic field within reasonable limits, and the beam will follow. So it is the magnets that determine whether the beam is accelerating or not. As long as they're in that bucket, in that potential well generated by the RF, they increase, they'll stay constant, they'll go down. I've actually seen experiments in the storage ring where you can actually very reduce the magnetic field and you see the beam staying in as you come down in energy as well, purely because it is captured by the RF and phase stability. Phase stability is very, very important. Without it, a synchrotron would not work. I hope that was emphasized strongly in the lectures you had on about longitudinal, um, longitudinal dynamics. So that's no good. So let's come back again. There's the diagram we've had to begin with, and there's the equivalent circuit. 
and so we're looking now at what is called reactive power. So the voltage is given by the resistive and the LDI by dt, uh, the reactive component. So the power is given by V times N, sorry, V times I. So that's given R, R I squared, which are I squared R, and that's given by L I times D I by D T. So the stored energy is a half L M I squared. That's the stored energy in an inductor. Okay, so D E by D T is equal to this thing, which is that thing. So V I, the total energy that you're working with, is given by the I squared R losses plus D by DT of the stored energy in the inductor. And that is the resistive power, and that is the reactive power, which alternates between positive and negative. As the field rises, it's positive. As the field falls, it is negative. The challenge of the cycling power converter is to provide and control the positive and negative flow of energy. And unless it's a very slow cycling facility and you don't have much energy in the magnets, it has got to be stored. You've got an accelerator that's got, say, a megajoule sitting in the magnets, which is eminently possible. That's not a big, that's not a big accelerator. And you're shifting that in 10 milliseconds then in fact that's 100 megawatts, the 100 MVA rating. That's a small power station. And not only you've got to put it in, but when it comes back out at you, you've got to have somewhere to put it as well. It could be very embarrassing. 100 MVA. No, no, again, are you acquainted? When we're talking about pure energy, resistive energy, we talk about watts or megawatts. But when we're talking about reactive power, we don't talk about watts. We talk about M, we call VA, volt amps, or kilovolt amps, KVA, or megavolt amps, MVA. Okay? There again, our electrical engineers would be well acquainted with that. Generated by alternating field cutting a conducting surface. Well, we've already talked about eddy currents, haven't we? Um, and eddy currents reduce negative dipole field, reduces the main field. Sexipole field affects chromaticity. Eddy currents proportional to, look, 1 over V. The effect of the eddy currents is proportional to 1 over V dB by dt. And this is the most critical situation at injection. So that's just emphasizing the point I've already made, that you want to have a rather gentle gradient at injection. If you try to inject in a very high gradient, things get very difficult. And then this, I've already talked about running in top-up mode the synchrotron radiation sources. So instead of having a continuous pulse of beam going in, you don't want it going in continuously. You want to run your booster synchrotron perhaps once every minute or once every two or three minutes. So it would be marvellous if we could have a situation where we could just turn it on, put a bloop in, then turn it off. We don't want to lose all the energy of keeping the thing going boom, 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 boom when it's not being used. Now then, and we're going to start looking at three different, I think it's three different types of accelerator. Fast and slow cycling, there's one in the middle as well. Slow cycling, repetition rates between 0.1 and 1 hertz. Typical value is 0.3 of the hertz, i.e. three seconds for the cycle. And the large proton synchrotrons of the last 50 years have been this type of uh, this type of power system. There's fast cycling, which goes between, I would say, between 10 hertz and 50 hertz. And the big electron machines of 50 years ago um, were fast cycling, generally about 50 hertz. And then there's ones in the middle now, which have started to appear more recently between 1 and 5 hertz. And these are for a separated functional electron accelerators, particularly in synchrotron radiation source boosters. An example, the CERN PS. There's all the parameters, and again, we've got Bill Gates's hitters because the formatting has gone wrong, but you can, I think it's more easy to interpret here. Th those are the basic parameters. Let's get on to the diagrams. There's the SPS current waveform starting, sorry, the SPS is the super proton synchrotron at, um, at CERN. Yep, everybody acquainted with that one. Starts at low level for injection, goes up to nearly 6,000 amps, 5,000 amps, comes back down again. In this case, it's in nine seconds, that pulse. So it's a very slow cycling facility. 
And here's the waveforms. Um, and this is the total volts. This is the inductive volts. And there's the total volts. And here, because it's so slow, there's not a lot of storage of the stored energy in the magnet. But there's still a situation where the volts goes negative and the current goes negative. Sorry, the, to the total volts goes negative and the current is still positive. So you're taking energy out of the magnet and putting it somewhere else. So there's the magnet power in the SPS. As I say, it's not, it's not massive, but it's still something that's going to be seen to. The next example, Nina, the um, 5 GB accelerator that we had here at Darsbury, built 50 years ago, decommissioned 40 years ago. Um, there's the premises for it. 5 GeV, um, cycling at 50 hertz, peak current 1362 amps, etc. Here's the current waveform, again going from virtually zero up to a high value of, I think it was 1250 amps, something like that. And here now, look at these waveforms. That's the resistive waveform. There it is rising to its maximum at high current. It's, it's on the same axis. It's on the, on the same axis as the inductive voltage. It's so small that you can hardly see it. The total inductive voltage, I seem to remember, was 140 kilovolts forward and reverse. And so here's the Nina power. There's this starting low, going positive, coming back. Now you've got to do something about that. You've got to store that little lot that's coming back because that's the one that would have had the, the 100 MVA or whatever, uh, your own little power station in the backyard. So what do we need? We need a unidirectional alternative waveform. We need accurate waveform control. We need accurate timing. We need to store the magnetic field energy going the right field. And if possible, it would be nice to be able to control the shape of the ramp from low energy to high energy. So how do we, we've now got all the requirements, you've looked at all the issues, we now have to decide exactly how we're going to do it. So we're going to look at cycling accelerators, how do we do it? Let's start with the slow cycling ones of 50 years ago. This is in for a laugh because it was mechanical energy storage so here is a high inertia flywheel to store the energy here's the magnet here's a, an, an ac alternator stroke synchronous motor and here's a set of old rectifiers 50 years ago they weren't solid state devices they were big bottles with mercury in them they glowed blue well, they still were switched like thyristors. Mercury arc rectifiers, they were called. And that they had a little electrode dipping into the mercury so you could turn them on, but you couldn't turn them off. They were similar to thyristors, only they were about this sort of size. They glowed blue with ultraviolet light that was very dangerous. So what happens? Well, um, when you want to accelerate, you allow the mercury arc rectifiers to go into forward conduction. And that through the, this device then starts working as an alternator and it takes energy from the flywheel and puts it into the magnet. And when you get to the peak field, you say, okay, folks, that's enough. And these things go into inversion. Remember, our, our thyristors could go into inversion and the mercury arc rectifiers could go into inversion. And the energy goes back into here. Now, an alternator and a synchronous motor are one and the same thing. No shouts of rubbish in the electrical engineers. The only difference is, is whether the rotor is leading or lagging the phase that is imposed by the circulating field of the status. And so this thing changes its phase very slightly and starts to motor. And this device then motors the, the flywheel back up to its original, or nearly back up to its original speed, because there's obviously some energy loss. So sitting at the end here, there's a little DC motor that just sort of just brings it back up to its required speed. What did this look like? That's what it looked like. There's a man down there. There is the alternator synchronous motor. Here is the 
Where's the flywheel? Here's the flywheel, and here's the DC motor sitting at the end. And that's just half of the whole system because there's another one of these up there as well. And this worked on the weak focusing machines Nimrod back in the 19, early 1960s. And I, as a young lad, wandered into this room because they didn't control the whole cable went. Wandered into this room when it was pulsing and it was absolutely terrifying because all this was mounted on an enormous great base plate that was on springs and when it went into rectification to power the magnus this thing <coughs> twisted by about an inch or two inches and then when it went into inversion it rocked over the other way and this was accompanied by the most dreadful sounds coming out of the thing and I was happy to get back out of it again. There was a very interesting sequence of events when one of the holes of these things, one of the bits of the rotor, came loose and proceeded to lathe into the stator windings. And it took them 15 minutes to shut the thing down. Um, and the man that, in those days, there was no computer control from the central control room. There was a big control room just to one side of this with, with a window where you could see what was happening with big switches and levers and knobs and all the rest of it. And some guy volunteered to go in and turn it, that, turn it off. And he got, a, he, he was, he got an award for um, some bravery. safety organization or something for, for his bravery of going in. Um, I'm told that when they were designing this machine, they worked out that if you got a short circuit on the output of um, this alternator motor then in fact that would stop and the flywheel wouldn't so the flywheel would <laughs> the flywheel would come off its bearings and go flying up through the roof and of course this was just <coughs> next door to Harwell with the reactor so what they didn't want is the flywheel bouncing across and breaking open the reactor so they, they they made sure that the direction of rotation was such that instead of bouncing over to main site Harwell it would bounce up onto the ridgeway up on the downs at the back of Rutherford Laboratory. So if the Reading Walkers are there, they'd see this bloody great flywheel coming up and bouncing uphill, which would be quite a lot. Right, so there, that's a bit of history of science. Slow cycling, there's also, later on, the SPS was directly connected to the uh, French 400 kV <laughs> system. Uh, and compliance with the authorities must minimise. So, so it was then possible that there was enough energy stored in a national grid system to provide the mop-up of the energy going backwards and forwards. And CERN was able to convince the French authorities that a connection to the, what did I say, um, 300 kV system would be um, reasonable for controlling, taking and giving power into the SPS. You have, to you have to control all these things. Um, and this is, again, I'm not going to go through the details, but the converter had 14 converter modules, each with a 12-pull system of control powers to rectify, supplying the ring dipoles in series, and each connected, it was connected directly to the French 400 kV system. And there had to be a very clever circuit of satellite reactors to control the waveform going back into the, um, into the French system. So let's now look at medium and fast cycling inductive storage. These again were the developed in the 60s and 70s, and inductive storage at that time was roughly half the cost per stored kilojoule compared to capacitive storage. The standard circuit was developed at Princeton Penn called the White Circuit. Mr. Professor White was the head of the organization. The circuit was not devised by Professor White, it was devised by one of his electrical engineers, but he got his name on it. Electrical engineers take warning. There's the circuit. Again, I'm not going to go into details. Here's the accelerator magnets, all in series. And this is for a single cell circuit. And then here's a capacitor that is going to resonate this little lot. And then back here you have an AC supply, which is inductively linked to another energy storage choke, a big choke, which is going to store the energy. But that is also resonated by the capacitor. And in the middle here, where there's not much going on, is the DC supply. And the booster for the ESRF, for the SRS, for Diamond, etc., all have these systems. And DAISY had this system, 
that's the electron synchrotron in Hamburg, and CEA in Cambridge had this system. So it's a pretty common system, and it's still regarded as very much the most likely system to choose for a fast cycling synchrotron. Magnetron is series, circuit oscillates the frequency omega, C1 resonates the magnet, C2 resonates the choke, as it's called. Um, the energy destroyer choke has primary winding, closely coupled to the main winding, but it's not a true transformer. As you know, a transformer has no gap, because otherwise you're wasting ampere turns going into the gap. This thing has got a gap which stores energy. You can only store energy in a magnetic system if there is a gap. The energy inside steel is B dot H, and if it's a good transformer, H is very low, even though B is high. So you don't have energy stored inside the yoke of the transformer. You have to have a gap to store energy. So this is both a choke and it has closely coupled windings. Only present AC in the DC, only small amount of AC is present in the DC source. No DC is present in the AC source, but there is no waveform control. It is a straightforward resonance system with inductance and capacitance, so everything is sine waves. Here's the magnetic waveform, usually fully biased, so that's ADC, that's the DC component there, that's the mean of the current. Here's the peak AC, here's the DC, so ADC, IDC is normally the same order as IAC, and so if, it, if they're equal, it's sitting on the bottom there, so you inject some around here, some low gradient, and you accelerate up to here, and this is the peak field where you extract the beam. Now, a single cell is fine for voltages up to about 10 kilovolts, but remember I said Nina had 140 kilovolts across the series connected magnets, and 140 kilovolts in your hot little hand is not a very good thing to have, even sitting around the back in the cubicle. So it has to be split into multiple circuits. And here's the concept of the multiple circuits. The, the magnets are all in series, so they all have the same current, but the actual choke is distributed into N blocks. This is showing one, two, three, four. In Nina, it was 10. I think in Daisy, it was 12. And there's the capacitor which both resonates the magnets in series and resonates this inductive choke in parallel. And here's the primary which is getting the, eight, the, the prime mover, if you like, the AC supply that's tickling up the whole thing. And then there's just one of these circuits that is split in the middle, and that's where you put the DC, because this is, this is resonating the choke, and this is resonating the magnet, so there's very little AC going through here. There's the Nina energy storage choke, which is now down, or now down at ISIS, um, but um, it is now 40 years old, and I think they're finally getting rid of it because they're a bit worried that um, how long it will last. If that goes poop, then in fact ISIS is in trouble. Magnets are in series still, to give continuity. The voltage in each section, if there's n sections, the voltage in any one section is only one over n, so you're reducing the voltage considerably. So the voltage to earth is only one half of n of the total. So Nina had 140 kilovolts across the whole caboodle. In any one unit, it had 14 kilovolts, but the maximum voltage to Earth was 7 kilovolts, which is rather more sensible and rather more realizable. The choke is split into n sections. The DC is in the middle of one. The AC is connected to a parallel primary. The parallel primaries must be closely coupled, and there's still no waveform control. Now, for medium cycling accelerators, this is the modern system. Technically, an economic development in electrolytic capacitors now means that the capacitor is a better way of storing energy. Semiconductor technology now allows for the use of fully switchable IGBTs, choppers, to give control and transfer of the energy to and from the magnet. And that now gives us waveform control. So medium-sized synchrotron cycling at one hertz now use this development for cheaper and dynamically controllable system. So it's waveform control and it now gives, um, gives discontinuous operation. Here's the example that the people that led on this was the Swiss light source SLS at the Paul Shearer Institute. Um, and here's the circuit that they came up with. And this is very similar to the chopper circuit that you've seen. Here is actually, here's the, here's the chopper circuit. 
which you've already seen, except this is a two quadrant, not a four quadrant chopper. And there's two units. Here's the magnet, here's smoothing, and here is the energy storage in this capacitor here. And by controlling this, this is essentially an amplifier. By controlling this, you can pass any waveform you like into the magnet. There's a story which I'm assured is true that the, um, in the early stages to convince the management that this is workable and has a sufficiently high bandpass, they actually took a small model of this circuit, or perhaps it was the prototype model of the circuit, they put a CD player in at one end and they put a loudspeaker out at the other end and played music through that. And it worked. And they convinced the director that they knew what they were doing as well. Those are the parameters, fairly small compared to the sort of voltages that were flying around on Nina, but notice the frequency is down at 3 hertz, and so therefore the inductive voltages are much less. And those are the SLS booster waveforms. You can study those. Here's the power. There's only a bit of a negative there. It's not nearly as big as it was in Nina. Um, and here's the, um, the current and the voltage. There's the current and there's the voltage. And there's the input voltage. This is where the this is where the energy is coming back out and going into that big capacitor. Then it's being taken out of the big capacitor again. And then here's the current going in from the DC initial energy circuit, an energizing circuit. And so you can see that this it's electrolytic capacitor. So it, it never the voltage never goes negative. These electrolytic capacitors do not like negative voltage. So it keeps the sort of the positive voltage. Uh, at um, 500, 500 volts um, and oscillates by something in the order of plus or minus 100 volts. So in comparison with the white circuit, it does not need costly energy storage chokes, they've gone. Um, the limited rated output and voltage that they provide flexibility of the output waveform, so we've got waveform control. And the switch on the um, the choppers require less than one second to stabilize, so you can go for chop-up mode as well. However, the current and voltage possible in the switching circuits are restricted by component ratings. And here's an example. When this was already operational, when we were building Diamond, we looked at how we could use this system for the booster synchrotron, the 3 GB booster synchrotron of Diamond. And here's we had the option of controlling, of varying the number of turns on the booster magnet during, during the design phase. And so if we had 16 turns, we got this set of um, parameters, the peak alternating voltage of 1.8 kilovolts, and high turns gave us 20, and it gave us this. And in fact, we were looking at operating at 5 hertz, and there was a big debate as to whether we should go a lower frequency than 5 hertz. But eventually we were able to demonstrate but I can't remember which one was chosen, but using these figures, it would be feasible to build a high a 5 hertz system. And the diamond booster at, um, down at RAL is now working at 5 hertz. Finally, the, um, the ogre sitting on top of the mountain, the ley line mode of resonance. Most often seen in cycling systems, producing a disturbance at the next injection but they can be present in any system. Stray capacitance to earth makes the inductive magnet string a delay line. So if you have a delay line, you can have different currents in different magnets, given by the frequency at which you get standing waves on the delay line. There's the, um, there's the equivalent circuit. Here's the magnets. Here's the capacitance to earth, which you haven't put there, but it's there naturally. Something you try to minimize, but it's there, you can't get rid of it. Bah. And you then get, there's, a, there's an earth at each end, or the, they're the same point, this is just round in a circuit. So there's an earth point there, which is the same as that. So you can get these standing waves, you can get the voltage going up and down, and those are the associated current. And that's, you would call it fundamental. And then you can get, well that's probably the fundamental, that's the half fundamental. Uh, I'd call that the fundamental and the second harmonic. And you see that the current is different in different magnets. And that is dreadful because you can lose beam. And with Nina, when this was set to ringing, we would lose not just beam at one 
the next injection with two or three injections. And it was set ringing. Oh, here's the equations. You can study those at will. What excited them? Well, we were putting on one of the magnets a bump to just distort the orbit during injection. And so and we were using a back leg on the magnet, not a different magnet, but one of the main accelerator magnets. And what it did was disturb the voltage on that magnet. And that would then propagate out through the rest of the, of the system. So you've got to keep straight capacitance as low as possible. You've got to avoid local disturbances on any one magnet. And there is solutions. Damping loops are possible. And we did a great deal with damping loops. But it would be much better if we never did that to a magnet. So that, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, is the end. May the power be with you. I think the original statement was let the force be with you. But we're dynamic. Our forces result in power. So let the power be with you. Thanks very much indeed. Do you know something? <coughs> Very naughty, and I've had this on mute all the time. <laughs> we did not be recording. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> we'll just start again. Do you remember last week, not two weeks ago, um, the, the 